Welcome back. This is lecture 22 of our lecture series. And today we'll talk about the discrete symmetries, specifically in, in regard to the Dirac uh, field. So we're attacking the C, P, and T symmetries uh, for fermions, right? Uh, I put some references here, of course. The most complete and rigorous treatment of this subject is, is done in, in Weiberg's book. But it can be a lengthy one and it goes beyond uh, uh, the time we have for this subject in this course. Right? So I'm following mostly Peskin's uh, derivation, which is shorter but glosses over some, some, some details. For instance, we, we won't worry too much about the phases that can be introduced by these symmetries, specifically because in the case of fermions, we can absorb most of those phases. But I refer the interested student to Weinberg's treatment if you want to see the whole uh, more complete story. So what is, what is the idea here, right? We have been treating uh, the Lorentz group as if it's just basically the Lorentz transformation, right? Uh, which are continuous uh, rotations and boosts in space-time, right? In Minkowski space-time. Uh, but this is not the whole story, right? If you think and you define uh, a Lorentz transformation as uh, uh, the Lorentz group, as the group of transformations that leave the Minkowski uh, measure defined in this way in our convention of uh, signs, Right? Invariant, if I think about all the transformations that leave this invariant, right? the continuous ones are not the whole story. I can immediately think at least two more, right? which are parity transformation, which is defined by P that takes uh, the space-time coordinates and take them to these ones. In other words, I, I change the sign, I reflect all the three space components, right? And I can think of the time inversion, right? Or time reversal symmetry, right? Which takes, does the same for the time, right? Instead of flipping the sign of space, I flip the sign of the time component. And, 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 and it's pretty obvious that both these, uh, these transformations leave x squared up here invariant, right? So they also preserve this uh, Minkowski uh, uh, interval and, and, uh, sh and should be part of the, of the um, Lorentz group. In fact, if I define a Lorentz transformation in this way, right, it takes some uh, space-time coordinates into x prime given by lambda x, right? If I demand that this transformation leaves this uh, Minkowski interval invariant, right? Uh, you, you can easily show that this implies that the determinant uh, of lambda square must be 1 and the time component of this uh, uh, transformation the square must be bigger or equal to 1, right? And you can use this to classify uh, four different uh, branches, let's call it, of the, the Lorentz group, right? Uh, let me put a scheme here, right? This is the way you can do it. So the part that has determinant equal to one and uh, this time component bigger than one, right? Is the part that we know and love. It's called the proper or tokernos. Uh, Lorentz subgroup because the identity is contained here, right? And, and this is composed by the rotations and boosts, right? But then you can combine this kind of transformation, right? The rotations and boosts 
by applying parity or applying time reversal or both. And then you get to these other parts of the group. This is the full Lorentz group. And this is just the proper orthogonal subgroup. And then here I, I define the names for the other parts, right? You have the proper non-orthogonals, the improper non-orthogonals, etc. Right? Uh, and but you have all these, uh, this is the full Lorentz group. Right? There's one more transformation that has nothing to do with space-time, but you can imagine. And at least in principle, most people would consider uh, this to be a good symmetry of nature, right? Which is called the charge conjugation symmetry. And what, what we call this, uh, we have talked about this one before when we were defining um, Majorana particles, right? And this transformation, what it, it does, it takes particles into antiparticles and vice versa, right? When you apply C to antiparticle, it makes it into a particle and vice versa, right? For now, this is very abstract, but we'll define the action of this uh, transformation on, on mathematical objects uh, soon, right? For now, I just want to give you the concept, right? And, and, and at least in principle, you would expect this to be a good symmetry of nature, right? You would expect uh, particles and antiparticles to behave uh, in the same way. In fact, people actually believe, uh, start of last century, that all these symmetries should be good, right? Again, very intuitive. You wouldn't expect this reversal of, of space to change how, how things behave or time reversal either, right? But as usually nature is, does, doesn't care too much about our expectations, right? So the standard model, specifically the weak force, violates parity in the most extreme way, right? And then people, at, at first that caused a shock, right? Then people said, okay, okay, okay. So parity, can be violated, but CP, I mean, the, the combination of applying parity and charge conjugation should, should uh, be good. And then they found out that CP is actually also violated in the standard model, right? And then there's a theorem, and this one is actually a theorem, saying that if you demand uh, reasonable stuff of a field theory, specifically uh, uh, or, or mainly uh, unitarity, and Lorentz invariance, right? Then it should be invari invariant of, uh, over CPT transformation. This is called the CPT theorem. We won't go over it here, right? But uh, it means, and this is essential for making sense of field theories, right? But it also means that if CP is violated in the standard model, that means T must be violated too, in order to keep CPT invariant. So in the end, all these all these uh, symmetries individually are violated by the standard model, right, of particle physics. So so much for our expectations. So what we want to do now is define define uh, these three uh, discrete symmetries. Uh, uh, rigorously or almost rigorously and see their effects on fermions, right? Because then that allows us to build models or theories, right? Where we can impose these symmetries or not. It helps to be able to know what kind of blocks you put in your Lagrangian, which will violate one or more of these symmetries, right? Of course, if you want to build a model which is invariant and in parity and for instance uh, QED electromagnetism is invariant individually under C, P and T, right? So it it's worth to know how how you build these blocks. And we'll do this one by one with these symmetries. Let's start with the simplest one which is parity, right? 
What parity does, as, as, as I already said, is to make uh, this inversion of all the three coordinates, right? So if I apply this to my reference system here, what happens is this, right? X and Y are in the plane in my drawing here, right? So they, they just reverse and Z is coming out and now it's going into the screen, right? Uh, this looks uh, all of it, but actually you can, you can uh, understand it better if you bring Z over here, let's rotate it around Y. I'm not really doing anything in this case. I just bring Z over here. And, and then you see that the X, Z plane really didn't change. What happened is that Y reversed without changing the other two coordinates. This is important because it gives a much deeper insight as to what parity is doing, right? The parity transformation is really what you see when you look in a mirror, right? You see uh, a mirror will make objects moving closer, right? Uh, when you move forward, the thing in the mirror is moving in the other, in the opposite direction, it's moving towards you. And the same is the other way around, right? And that's the inversion of Y. What you're really changing is this uh, vector product, right? In the, in the left uh, reference frame, we know that I is equal to K product uh, J, right? This is how the vector product uh, works here. And in this case, I is the opposite, right? Is equal to J times K, which is minus K J, right? So you're really changing things that are related by a, a right-hand product rule into a left-hand product rule. And that's why we call this a chirality transformation, right? This is, you're really changing right into left and vice versa. That's why when you look in the mirror and you, and you raise your high, right hand, it actually looks like you're raising your left hand in the mirror. Because the relation between thumbs and and, and, and the other fingers is exchanged by the reflection in the mirror, right? That's what parity does essentially, right? In terms of particles, right? This has a very important consequence because imagine that the particle has some angular momentum, maybe spin or some, some actually if it's a composite particle, it might, might be really angular momentum from rotations inside it, right? Uh, and suppose you project that angular momentum in, in the direction of the momentum, the linear momentum. That we call helicity, right? So you could take the spin, which I represented by this rotation here, but might be just intrinsic spin, right? And I'm projecting it on linear momentum. And suppose this is the relation for a particular particle. Since I'm rotating in this direction, right? It's going behind it here and rotating this way. It is a right-handed rule, right? The, the spin is oriented, in this case, in this direction, and that's what we call a right-handed particle, when the spin or the angular momentum is oriented in this, uh, the projection is in the same direction of the linear momentum, right? If you reflect it in the mirror, the rotation or the spin, right? The angular momentum is the same, right? It rotates in the same way. But the momentum in that direction now is reversed uh, towards uh, the mirror. That means the, the angular momentum or the spin is still oriented like that. And, and now the projection, right? The projection of the spin is still oriented like that. And now the particle has become left-handed. So again, chirality will change right-handed particles into left-handed particles. Now, we want to implement that uh, in, in my fields, right? I have to implement this transformation somehow as an uh, operator acting on my fields. If at all possible, right? Because it's just the simplest thing you, you, you have. I would like to, this to be a unitary uh, operator and a linear one. Right? If I can find a linear uh, unitary operator that does this, I'm in paradise. Because then, remember, my psi, my fields, 
I write in as complicated objects. They are integrals. You have these for, for vectors, right? For, for um, spinners, right? You have these uh, functions that take care of the spin orientation, have exponential, and you have creation and annihilation operators. Right? I want these operators to be linear, to act straight on these operators and go through all the numeric factors that are around it, right? Which I can write, I know this is an a, a operator with many indexes, but I can just write explicitly the indexes and, and then it all become just uh, numbers that my operator goes through and act on this guy, right? It turns out that for parity, this is doable. I can actually find a linear um, uh, unitary operator that does that. I'll call this uh, P, the P operator, right? And uh, P squared needs to be one because if I reverse two times, I should go back to the original one. And I, as, as, as I'm saying, I'm, fine, I'm defining it as a unitary operator. So P dagger, is equal to p minus one, which is p, right? And, and, and okay, all's fine, right? And I'll define the action of this guy on the creation or annihilation operators, right? In this way. So p acting on the operator that creates or annihilates, it doesn't matter. Right, uh, I state with spin S and momentum P, right? If I act with this operator here, right? I'll get a S, because spin is not really changing, but a reverse momentum, right? That's the action I'm defining. And of course, there could be a complex phase here. You never know, right? This is, all these operations are defined minus a phase. And let's see what kind of constraints we can put on this phase. And it does the same with the antiparticles, right? If I take one of the B operators, I can get this, right? If you want to know how he acts on A dagger and B dagger, just take the dagger of all of this. You can use this very easily and you see just there's only a complex conjugation on the phases here, nothing else. Right? Let me put a box around this. Try to get the color for my box here. Right? If you bring together this uh, constraint I'm putting on this operator with uh, these phases, you can easily show that the phases square. Right? Since I have to, if I apply it twice, I, I should have the identity. That means that the phase uh, modulus square should be one, right? Both of them. I just apply it twice and you see that's what show up. And if I want this to be the identity, uh, these phases need to have modulus of one. Now let's see how the field, what, what effect this will have in the full field. Right? I, I want to rewrite this in terms of this, right? This is really what I want to know, the useful one. Knowing this, I want to get this uh, expression. To do that, let's first uh, find some uh, useful um, relations because, again, I, I'll have to invert momenta, so I want to know how these two functions, u and v, behave when I invert the momenta. Right? Let me define the invert, inverted momenta. Let's call this p tilde uh, p0 minus p. Right? And remember, I'm only inverting the space part of the momenta. I'm not doing anything with the energy. Right? It's just there. Hmm? And let's see what happens with, with how can I write u of p, right? Of course, there's an index s here, but I'll suppress it just to keep the notation light. I'm not doing anything with this thing, right? Uh, let me see if I can rewrite this guy in, 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 this guy in terms of p tilde, right? 
Remember, this guy is P sigma psi P sigma bar psi which I can rewrite in a very useful way for us. Remember that when we define this field, so again, this is result of results from the classical solutions for the Dirac uh, equation, right? Uh, these sigmas are defined in this way, right? This is just the identity sigma, the three Pauli matrices, and bar is actually the same thing we, I did here with the tilde, is 1 minus the Pauli matrices, right? That means I can easily rewrite P sigma, right, the scalar product, as P tilde sigma. I just bar, right? I just pass the sign from one to the other. Right? Just transported this sign. Right? In this case, I put a minus sign on both spatial parts, is spatial parts, and, and in this case, I can also do this sigma bar as p tilde sigma. Again, I just threw the sign from the, this minus sign from here into here. Right? Using that up here, I can rewrite this guy as sigma p tilde. Sigma bar. Let me try to make this tilde P tilde sigma psi psi. And remember that in our uh, in our convention, gamma zero, one of the uh, direct matrices, right? is actually just this, right? Which is the matrix that inverts these two components, right? Uh, and this is, this means that this is gamma zero U, because I just have to reverse those two, and this will be U of P tilde, which is a useful relation, right? So I can relate the U of uh, the momenta with this component inversed to the one without the inversion just by applying gamma zero. Right? I could do the same for V. Right? It's a similar relation, but now I have, if you remember, V is very similar, but there's a critical sign here, this sign is important because if I do the same, right, I apply these transformations here. If I apply them here, right, I, I get uh, what I want, P tilde sigma bar, I get minus P tilde sigma, right? But now, if I invert and throw this back up here, this is very similar to this, but the sign went up. So I, I, I need to bring this sign out and write minus gamma zero V of P tilde. Right? So this sign is important. It will end up here. So now I have the relations I needed. And I can apply... Uh, uh, parity to the field and use these relations to write it conveniently, right? So to P of Psi X, P, this is minus one, but P my, this guy, P minus one is equal to P, so I'll suppress and just write like that, right? And then I have to act here. Let me put P here and I'll put at the end and write Psi of X in the middle. So this is the integral of 3, 3, P over 2 pi cubed, normalization, sum over spin, 
hmm, of a of s t u s t of p exponent of minus i p x plus b s dagger of p v s of p exponent of i p x and p is acting to the right of all of this hmm? so i want to know what does it do right since now i want to use these two relations right when it gets to the operator it just flips the sign of p and uh, pops up a phase huh? so let me copy this in here and um, and act with these guys right so here i get a sign since there are linear operators that go through to all these all these numeric factors and go straight here, right? I have PAP and PBP, right? Which I'll, I'll, I'll write straight away. In this case, I get a phase, which is eta A, right? And I get the sign here. That's all. In this case, since it's the dagger, I get the complex conjugate of the phase right, and a sign. And that's pretty much it, right? But now I want to rewrite this because this now is not psi anymore, right? This is not psi of x anymore. You have stuff in there that, that makes it so I cannot write. But I, I, I want to write it in terms of a psi field. So let me, let me make some transformations there. Let me make massage the expression a bit to write into in a form that is convenient right so what i would do in this integral notice the integral here i have is on three momentum right so i'll do a change of variables and take p into minus p right which is taking is the same as taking p into p tilde for the for momentum hmm? and notice also that uh, px which is equal to p0 t0 minus p vector x vector in our metric right is the same as p0 t0 right minus p minus x which is kind of obvious but that means that's the same as p tilde uh, of t minus x. And I can use this to rewrite these exponentials already in terms of the p tilde, right? Which I'm changing into, right? That means I can rewrite that expression, right? This inversion does nothing here in the integral because, again, I, f I get a minus sign, but I have the flipping of the integration limits. That is just the same, right? But the integral now is on p tilde, d3 p tilde, which is minus p, right? This guy also does not depend on the sign. All I have to do is remember that I'm doing the integral for and calculating stuff with p tilde here. These I can copy. Right? But I remove the sign because now is P tilde vector. Hmm? This guy, when I, I go from when I do this change of variables, I'll get US of P tilde. Right? Uh, but that I can already get straight away from 
here, right? I can just write u of p in terms of gamma zero of u of p tilde. So that's what I'm doing. Let me write this as gamma zero u s of p tilde. And um, the exponential becomes um, minus i p tilde t minus x. And the same thing here, right? So I'll just write it more quickly. B P tilde vector S dagger gamma zero E S P tilde exponential of I T X minus X, sorry. Right? So I rewrote everything now in terms of this variable. Now if I look at this, the only thing I have to still choose here to really write this as a psi of something, right? Is these phases. If I want the field itself to have a, a definite parity right because with for general phases this guy will not have a definite parity but if i choose the the appropriate phases it does and the choice of i'm making i mean is that eta b star is equal to minus eta a right again uh i'm not taking too much care about these phases but bottom line is that most of these fields are defined minus a phase right so i can redefine remember there's a symmetry we didn't discuss these uh, for the uh, fermionic field but we did for this uh, complex scalar field right and and so i can i have some freedom with these phases which i'm using to choose a particular representation of the parity now, right? And 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 that's how, how, how as far as I will discuss that. If I I choose that, then the phase comes out, right? I can just substitute eta b star here by minus eta a. Eta a goes out, right? And what I I have left here gamma zero also needs to come out here. When I remove eta a and gamma zero, I get what is left here is just psi of t minus x, right? Because p tilde is just a variable of integration. It doesn't matter. I can even throw away all the tildes. What really matters is that I got these minus x instead of x here. So bottom line is that I found that p psi of x p is equal to eta a gamma zero psi of t minus x right and that's how the field transforms under parity let me put a box around this good psi almost always comes together with a psi bar so it pays to also uh, figure out the transformation for psi bar Right? We can start that by uh, obtaining uh, p psi p dagger, right? Which will be the dagger on this side here is eta a uh, complex conjugate because it's just a phase psi dagger of t minus x times gamma zero dagger. But in our convention, gamma zero is real, so gamma zero dagger and symmetric, right? So gamma zero dagger is just uh, gamma zero then uh, psi bar right p psi bar of x p is just p psi dagger gamma zero p hmm? which p goes through this gamma zero right so gamma zero comes out here and i get p psi dagger p uh, gamma zero which is the same since these guys are uh, 
your medium, right? I can rewrite this like that, right? And use this line, right? Substitute this here and get eta a star psi. This is psi bar, right? Psi bar t minus x. And there's an extra gamma zero here, which I leave here. And this is the transformation property, right? From the first, from here to here is what I, I need to get the transformation properties for psi bar. With that in mind, I can start uh, seeing how bilinears transform. Remember the bilinears we defined on, on last video, right? These are the, uh, uh, since we want these Grassmann numbers to be combining you, these bilinears, these bilinears are the essential building blocks that you put in the Lagrangians to, to make interactions, uh, kinetic terms, everything, right? Mass terms. Right? So if we know how all these bilinears transform, we can start playing model building in Lagrangians, right? Put the blocks that we want to violate or preserve parity. So let's take a look at a few bilinears just to get the gist of it, right? If I want to see how, uh, say, psi bar psi, which is the most, uh, the simpler bilinear we can think of, transforms under parity, right? This goes into uh, P psi bar psi P, right? I can insert a, a, a P square here, right? Because that's one and get P psi bar P, P psi P and use these two uh, expressions, right? I'll get eta A from here, eta A star here. So I get just eta a modulus square, which we know from the start this is just one. This is just one, right? Uh, I get this from the psi bar part. I get psi bar of t a minus x, gamma zero. And, this, uh, and from this part, I get gamma zero again, psi of t minus x. Right? This gamma zero square is also the identity, four by four identity, right? Which means that psi bar psi went into psi bar psi, but these guys are calculated at t uh, minus x. This is what we call being even under parity, right? There was, it's just the same object, but now calculated in this new reference frame, right? Now let's look at a pseudoscalar, right? Remember we, we defined a guy, let me put one box around this guy because this is, well, in the end, I'll summarize all these transformation properties in a table. Uh, for now, let's just keep that one. Psi bar, gamma five, psi, is a guy that is a bilinear that I call the pseudoscalar last video. Let's see what happens with it. If I take the parity transformation, right? again, I do the same tricks, but now I'll have this with a gamma five right here, let's say. It could be to the left or it could be here too, depends on where I insert these guys, but it doesn't change anything, right? I, I have to come with this P over gamma five, which is fine. P commutes with this uh, spinor space, right? And then use P comes over here. And then I can use uh, those two expressions up there, right? I'll get to almost the same I have here. Let me copy this expression with the exception that now I have a gamma five right here in the middle, right? Other than that, it's the same calculation I did before. Again, this is one. And gamma zero square is one. But to get gamma zero there, I have to go over this gamma five, right? 
And this is a minus sign because gamma 5 anti-commutes with all the other uh, Dirac matrices. And that means this is even under parity transformation. So psi bar gamma 5 psi goes into minus psi bar gamma 5 psi t minus x. And that's exactly why we call this a pseudo-scalar, right? Because it's still a scalar under the proper orthogonal continuous Lorentz group, right? So it's a scalar under Lorentz transformations, the continuous one, right? But has the wrong sign for parity. So it's not exactly a scalar, it's a pseudo-scalar. It's almost a scalar, right? So that's that's how we name this guy, right? Let's do let's let's take uh, this forward, right? Uh, also, just a comment. It's a, that's an important comment. This guy is not Hermitian. If you if you take the Hermitian conjugate of this, you see that it's not Hermitian. So it usually doesn't go like that into Lagrangian. But you can always do this, right? And and you see that this guy is Hermitian. This guy is Hermitian and has the same transformation properties under parity as this one. I could just have an I sitting here. Right? So usually the, the, the block that puts a pseudo-scalar bilinear in the Lagrangian comes with an I in front because you want Hermitian operators in your Lagrangian. Right? Now let's see the vector, the vector bilinear. Psi bar, gamma mu, gamma mu psi. In this case, very similar situation. I won't repeat. I won't repeat everything. In fact, this phase never matters for bilinears. It will always, since it, the the modulus of the phase is one in bilinears, it goes away, right? And the I'll get this, right? But now instead of the gamma five, I get a gamma mu, right here. All the rest is the same. But this guy, I need to be careful. Now I need to do it almost component by component, right? If you look, what happens here is that there's two cases, essentially, right? There's the case where mu for the zero component of this operator, that means mu equals zero, right? This will be gamma zero to the cube, which is just gamma zero. Right? So I'll be left with a gamma zero here and no other sign. So the the end result will be psi bar gamma zero psi calculated at t minus x. Right? Both fields are calculated at this point. For the case where mu is i, so any of the three uh, other gamma matrices, right? Then what I get here is gamma zero, gamma i, gamma zero, which is the same as gamma i dagger, right? Which is minus gamma i. So that for the three uh, space components, right? I'll get this to be minus psi bar gamma i psi t minus x. So the three uh, space components are odd under parity transformation and the time one is even, right? I have a way of, uh, uh, of uh, indicating this, which is a very awkward notation, but it is what most people use, which is this. Remember, this does not mean minus one, two mu, because otherwise number two would also be positive. This actually just means uh, 1 for mu equals 0 and minus 1 for mu equal i equal 1, 2, 3. Right? Be careful with these notations. Very easy to, to get confused and put, like, especially for mu equal 2, which is not intuitive. Right? But this I can use to indicate this thing. Psi bar gamma mu 
psi of t minus x, right? which is what I was looking for. And it's quite nice, actually, because this is a vector, right? And I'm saying that under parity, the three vector spatial, spatial components, the three spatial components are transforming as a vector. I'm inverting just like momentum, just like position, right? It's transforming just as, a, as the other vectors, the, the, the position, this, the, the coordinates, etc., right? And then there's this guy, right? When I take the same thing and put a gamma 5 in here, right? And then what happens? I, I go through the same thought process, right? But now, but now, I have a gamma 5 matrix uh, right here, to the right of the gamma mu. Right? And of course, it's the same logic, right, between these, uh, these uh, three guys. But in order to get there, I have to bring this gamma 0 over here. And that gives me an overall sign. Just put gamma zero here, leave the gamma five there. That gets me an overall sign. And the rest is just repeating this logic. Hmm? Which means that this guy will go into this with an overall minus sign here. And now I have a gamma five here too. Which means that, in this case, only the time inverts sign, and the three spatial components don't, right? Is, is a vector with the opposite sign is a pseudo vector, right? Again, it's the same thing that I did for pseudo scalars, right? It's a scalar with the wrong sign under parity. This is a vector with the wrong sign under parity. I won't do all the bilinears are still missing the tensor bilinears and i don't know i could put a derivative here and now you you have to to see for instance uh psi bar del mu psi because uh, besides the gamma matrix that will be here del mu is also changing under parity right the three spatial components of del mu are also getting assigned so you can look at this these, all these objects, I'll show a table at the end, but you see the logic, right? You have to just use commuting relations between direct matrices and, and figure out what happened, right? So let's go to the next uh, uh, discrete symmetry. Okay, so our, our next symmetry is time reversal. So now we're really thinking about like a movie running backwards, right? All motions are reversed. In fact, even angular momentum right, needs to be reserved, but whatever is rotating, rotates uh, the opposite A, and by consistency, even intrinsic spins need to be reverted. Right? So what I want now, and this is uh, pictorically what, what is going on, so both uh, spins and angular momentums are inverted and momenta. Right? I want P to go into minus p so that everything that is moving goes backwards now the spin needs to go into minus s right and time of course needs to be reversed right once again that's what i want right and i need to act with that upon my creation and annihilation operators my field right in the end Right? If I could find a unitary linear operator that does this, it would be amazing again. But this time, sadly, you can't. Right? Peskin proves this on page 67. Schwartz do an interesting discussion on it too. I won't go, go through uh, the whole discussion. What you can already see, right? if, if you're interested, take a look there. But what you can already see Right? is that I already did 
this when I was doing parity uh, transformation, I already did this transformation on the fields. Right? And I have shown that taking P, just taking P into minus P in the whole uh, expansion for, for my field, right, didn't lead to a time inversion, but to a space inversion. Right? And, 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 and the solution to, to that problem is to make this operator not be linear, but be anti-linear. And by that I mean that it has two components. It has one component that acts upon uh, uh, the creation and annihilation operators. I want that to be unitary. Right? I don't want to deal with no unitary operators. right? But when it goes through complex numbers, it uh, complex conjugates them. Right? So that makes for an anti-linear operator. Right? Since the part that acts uh, um, upon the, the operators themselves is unitary, that makes it also an anti-unitary operator. Right? That means I'm keeping this property, but not the one where it just goes through all these numeric factors. It, it can go through them, but we will complex conjugate everything. So now I'll have an anti-linear anti-unitary operator that implements my time reversal, right? Trying to do this in the linear unitary way leads to a lot of strange stuff that is uh, exploring Pasking and, and, and to some degree in shorts, right? I won't be showing you the wrong way to do it. Let's go straight to the right one, right? Then I just have to uh, decide how this guy, once I, I, I notice this will solve my problem and I'll show it, it really does solve the problem, right? In, in the sense that I now, if I invert momentum, the expansion of the field, that will lead me to inversion of time and not an inversion of space, right? And uh, then I have to decide how this guy acts upon the creation and annihilation operators, right? And I want these two things to happen. So I'll just define T a p s t minus one now i have to be careful t minus one is not t in fact it, it can also be shown for the four fermions t, t squared needs to be minus one right and uh, this will be a minus s p so i'm doing this right and same for b so T, B, P, S, T minus 1 equal to B minus P minus S, right? Fine. Let me put a box around this. So this defines, this together with these properties defines my time reversal operator. Again, I could put phases here, and I'm ignoring those phases. Uh, the best way to see is that uh, uh, Weinberg, page 78, shows that in this case, I can absorb the phases completely. Even without the bilinears, I can, these phases don't matter. Right? And, and fine. Now, let's see. I, what I want to do is uh, find, again, the transformation for the field. But in order to do that, I have to worry about how US of P and V transform when I invert spin, when I invert momenta, right? Otherwise, I won't be able to do that. So let's do first these operators, right? In the, the, the Fourier expansion of the field, right? I'll have something like AP of S times USP exponential of ipx right and when i act with these operators i'll have this right being anti-unitary when this guy comes over here i get t a s p t minus one but these are all complex numbers right so i need to do u 
s p star exponential minus i p x right and then this guy just becomes uh, a of minus s minus p according to this definition right same thing for the b so t b p s dagger because that's what shows up in the field i'll worry about psi bar later so i'm, I'm worrying about the transformation of psi right? v s p exponential of minus i p x t minus one will be b minus p minus s dagger v s p star uh, exponential of i p x notice the change of the sign in the exponential which is the whole trick right that's what will lead to a time inversion instead of a space inversion is this sign right now i, I have to be a little careful with the spin right it's not easy to flip spin right uh, when I first defined mu and v, I used a very simple, specific basis for spin, where, say, u is defined in C of s, and I took psi 1 as 1, 0, and psi 2 as 0, 1, and eta 1 was the opposite, and all that, right? Now I want to do something more uh, general, right? So let's call let call psi up, which is my psi one, right? Psi one is psi up as a rotation in in theta psi plane because this is this one zero is just in the direction of z, right? In the third component of uh, the third Pauli matrix, so the z direction. Let's rotate this so theta and phi are angles, right, in relation to this uh, z direction, and write this as a spin that is pointing up in a generic direction specified by these two angles. So here, here I'm just doing the rotation. Right? So this is spin up in this uh, direction. Uh, specified by theta phi then psi 2 will be the down one r theta phi apply here right which will be minus the exponential minus i phi psi theta 2 um, cosine theta or two. Fine. So these is our these are my general direction spin orientation, right? And of course, the psi of s will be the pair psi up, psi down. Now, now what I want to know, right, since I need here minus s, is how, what are the psi of minus s uh, spins, right? What are the guys that have the opposite, right? I, I reversed the spin direction, right? Let's choose a, a, an axis, right, a, a generic axis n. n is just a unitary uh, unit length uh, vector right and and let's assume we found some direction in in let's baptize this psi plus which can be a one of those guys or a combination that is oriented has a plus sign into that direction that means it's its projection is positive in the direction n, right? This is the projector 
uh, operator. You could imagine if you, you have difficulty with, with that, right? If you take n to b, let's uh, for example, right? If you take n to b 0, 0, 1, for instance, to be the, the z direction, then this projector would be just sigma 3, right? If I make this product, it will be just sigma 3. And then it's obvious that plus is the guy that is spinning up in, in the z direction, right? Because uh, sigma 3 is just 1, minus 1, 0, 0, right? Pretty easy. So this is a generic one that projects the spin in the direction of n, right? And, and, and being an eigenvector of that with plus sign mean this is spinning up in that particular direction. Now let's suppose I apply the same operator to this very non-intuitive ansatz. Let's take this guy. Just because, right? And see what is the what I want to see if this is this guy is also an eigenvector of this operator. And if so, with which uh, eigenvalue? This is easy, you have to remember that if you take uh, uh, this vector of uh, Pauli matrices and, and you commute sigma 2 with it, right? This goes into sigma 2 minus star, right? Minus sigma vector star. So sigma 2, when it goes over this, it complex conjugate and inverts the sign. I can use this to bring this minus i sigma 2 to the left here and rewrite. Let me bring this down here. I can rewrite this guy as minus i sigma 2. I'm using this property. Just put it as the color. Minus i sigma 2. And this will be minus, because of this minus, n sigma star. Of course, the star is only acting on the Pauli matrices because this is real, but I just want to write it like that. Psi plus star. Right? I just commuted these guys. These signs go away. And this guy I can write just as n sigma acting on psi plus, complex conjugate of everything. And this I know, right? This is the property this guy satisfies. So this is just plus sigma plus star because of this star here. Right? So what I found out is this, this is i sigma 2 psi plus complex conjugate right? which I can write appropriately as minus minus i sigma 2 psi plus complex conjugate which is the same vector I had here right? but now the eigenvalue is negative. That means that this combination is psi minus, right? Is the opposite spin. Psi minus is the opposite spin to psi plus because I projected on a general direction. This guy on a general direction, I get plus, and I project this guy on the same direction, I get minus as, as the eigenvalue, right? So this this uh, operation of multiplying by minus i sigma 2 and taking the complex conjugate is what inverts spin. That's what I'm finding out here. Right? And this was pretty uh, general, right? I, I, I didn't had to specify n at all. Right? That means that psi of minus s is just, I'll define this as, uh, minus i sigma 2 psi of s complex conjugate, right? 
which is what I wanted. And then there's some neat properties for these, right? This is the spin flipping operation. But if you do the calculations and you can use those uh, definitions up here and take the complex conjugate and, and multiply by minus i sigma 2, which by the way, minus i sigma 2 is just this matrix. It's a very simple one. Right? So you can play with those uh, definitions up here and, and show pretty easily uh, a set of relations that is the following, right? If I take minus i sigma 2 on psi up star, I get psi down, which is what I expected, right? I apply the flipping, I go from the up into the down. But if I apply again, Again, you expect these if you understand spin and you did some exercises about these in quantum mechanics, right? This goes into minus psi up. And then you have to apply it two more times in order to get back to where you were. You get this phase that you cannot get rid of. Right? Psi up. Now I apply this operation to this guy, right? Psi up star uh, goes into minus psi down and minus i sigma 2 minus psi down then go back to the original psi up right you have to if you do just two spin flips you get a sign right you have to go do two more spin flips to Get rid of the sign again, right? And that means that uh, this psi of minus s, if I apply that to the two components I have here for psi of s, right? Psi up will go into psi down, uh, sorry, down. But psi down will go into minus psi up, right? And this sign is important. That's the psi of minus s. Also, importantly, right, uh, we know that B dagger creates a particle, right, with all the quantum numbers opposite to that particle created by A dagger, right? But B dagger comes accompanied by V of s, which has in it eta of s, which is not the same as psi. In fact, ICTA, by that constraint that you want to invert all quantum numbers, including the proje projection of spin, means that eta of x uh, needs to be psi of minus x, minus s, right? We did this implicitly before. If you take uh, uh, that general uh, form that I wrote here and go back to the z direction, that means taking theta, and phi equal to zero, right? You see that psi of s was is becomes right just one zero zero one, but eta of s becomes using these two relations, right? Becomes zero one minus one zero and this is spinning up for the antiparticle and this is spinning down for the antiparticle right these are, uh, are the, how the indexes are organized right so that was this is implicit in Peskin it never says this quite explicitly but that's the convention it's using and it's also the convention for Weinberg right which proves that this needs to be like that uh, uh, equation in section 5.5. If you're really curious, you could go there and uh, and take a look, right? That this is uh, the proper way of choosing these spins. What this discussion shows is uh, how the operator should act, right? So when I act with the time reversal operators I'll, I'll, on on the creation and annihilation operators, 
I will get a and b of minus s, right? The momentum does not matter uh, in this discussion, right? And that means that this minus s must have this effect, should be a two p and minus a one p, right? According to this to uh, to this relation, right? And the same for b. So that's the point of this discussion. It shows us how to invert uh, spin. Whatever one and two are, that depends on the base I'm choosing. Now, I already know how the operators, uh, what the time reverse operator does to the creation and annihilation operators. Now I have to worry about the functions, right, that are around it in the Fourier expansion of the field. I need to know how, how to rewrite u and v so that I can re uh, take the Fourier expansion and write it in terms of a new field that depends now on minus s. So let's see about that, right? The useful relation I'm looking for is not hard to show. Let's think about u of minus s p tilde. So I'm, I'm trying to rewrite, I, I want to know how to write this guy, in which I inverted the three momenta, remember p tilde is just p zero minus p, right? inverting the space part of the momentum. Right? And this guy I can write, uh, using the usual expression, right? It's just p tilde times sigma, right? Since this is minus s, I would have to write psi of minus s here, which I'll write according to the discussion I just saw. I just, I just made one minus i sigma two psi s star. And the same here, p tilde sigma bar minus i sigma two psi s star. Fine. Now I, I want to take this minus i sigma two to the other side. We know this is an expansion in terms of uh, Pauli matrices and we know when sigma 2 goes over Pauli matrices, I get a sign and a complex conjugate, right? So I can just write this as minus i sigma 2 minus i sigma 2 p sigma star, right? So the star is because of the action of the sigma 2 and I also had a sign for the three, uh, right? The three component, uh, the, three, the three Pauli matrices, right? This sign I used to remove the sign of P tilde, right? That's what happened here. And I get uh, the same expression with, without the tilde, right? Same thing happens here. I get just P sigma bar star, right? And that's acting on Psi of S star, Psi S star. Right? I can write this in a more convenient way, right? Just removing this minus I sigma two outside. Right? To do that, I have to write it as a matrix. I'll write it in this way. Sigma two, zero, sigma two, zero acting on u s p which is a four component object star because of these stars right i got the same expression i had at the start but instead of minus s and p i have s and p so now i know how to rewrite the u of s p that appears in my Fourier expansion of the field in terms of this guy, which is what I'm interested in, right? In fact, these I can also put in terms of 
uh, uh, Dirac matrices, right? Minus i times this is just minus gamma one gamma three. Right? That you can check. That depends, of course, on the convention. And, but in our convention, if you make this multiplication, you get this, right? So U S P star. And I can invert this, right? Just have to multiply on both sides by gamma 1, gamma 3, and use the properties of the gamma matrices, and write U S P star as gamma 1, gamma 3, U minus S, U tilde. Remember, when I act with the time reversal operators on this, this is what I have inside my field expansion, right? I got this, which I already figured out, right? I know how to uh, write A of minus S. And now I, have, I know also U S star, right? It's just gamma 1, gamma 3 multiplied by U of minus S P tilde. Mm -hmm. The exponentials are also easy. So I'm almost there. I'm just missing V star, which is the same. I won't do the calculation again. I could do just a calculation very similar to this one and get, in fact, exactly the same. In fact, be careful with this discussion. If you're following some old printing of Peskin book, because he makes a pretty serious error at this point, he has already corrected and in newer printings, like he got a sign here with some argument that, so be careful, that's, that's the right way of doing it. And he has corrected that in newer printings. So if you find a sign here, be careful and look for the errata that he has online. He will explain how to do it. Okay, so now I have to put everything together in the expression for the field. Finally, so T psi T minus one is the integral of the three P over two pi cube, one over square root of two EP, the usual things, right? S, I already brought T over here. There's no complex numbers here. So, so far so good. Remember T is anti-linear. So if I go over some, uh, some complex number, I had to take the complex conjugate. And here I'll just write the usual expression, US P, Exponential minus IPX plus BS dagger P VSP exponential IPX and here I have T minus one. Right? When I go with these guys inside, I have to take complex conjugate of all of these. And these, and, and then act with the T's and the B's and the A's, which will invert spin and three momenta. Right? So let me copy what stays the same. Right? And now start the modification. So this guy gets a minus sign on the spin and the momenta. These two just are. Uh, I just take the complex conjugate of them. So this becomes a plus, and I have the star here. This guy, same thing, that's a minus S minus P, and these two become their complex conjugates, star minus. Okay, now I have I want to rewrite everything in terms of p tilde, like I did before. 
right? So remember, p x is the same as p tilde t minus x, right? These uh, are using the exponentials. Let me put it to the side here. This guy, I have just proven, you can still see the relation here for V, that this is gamma 1, gamma 3, um, U of minus S, P tilde, right? Like I shown here. Vs is gamma 1, gamma 3, U, V, sorry, V of minus S, P tilde, star. I'm just taking the star on both sides. Hmm? Oh, no, not star on both sides. What, what I'm saying, this is just without the star, right? Actually, that's the relation. And, and that is it, right? I can rewrite using all those relations. Gamma 1 and gamma 3 just come out all the way out here. These I just copy over. And I can change uh, these to p tilde because uh, the integral does not change. These I can also change to p tilde because this does not depend on the sign. Uh, the sum over s I'll just repeat. All right? And copy a bunch of stuff down here. Let me change colors. This exponential becomes the exponential of i p tilde t minus x, right? This guy just get copy over. This guy comes over here. Proper color. Right. And I have another exponential. It's very similar to this one. But with the opposite sign. Of course, I didn't get it. Squeeze it a little bit for space. Right? So this is this is the expression. Right? So now I can I can play with the signs a little bit, right? I can bring these minus out here and write this as minus and take the minus out from here and put it on time. And here's the whole trick, right? Because this was an anti-unitary operator, I changed this sign. So now when I I return the sign for the usual thing for a and u, right? I get an inversion in time instead of an inversion in space. Other than that, uh, I did the same with p tilde, right? The whole spin discussion is separated, right? But, but the inversion of momenta would never lead to an inversion in time if I didn't also take the complex conjugate of the exponential. Right? I do the same here, put a plus here, and put the sign on the time here. So now you see why taking an antilinear field, an antilinear operator for in, in time reversal uh, did what we wanted to do. Because now this is already done, right? What is written here is just gamma 1, gamma 3. Everything else is just the expansion of an operator for the inverted spin, for the inverted uh, momenta, right? So that's what I call a psi of minus t x, right? And, and, and that is uh, pretty much it for time inversion. Now I know how, how the field, uh, how the field uh, transforms. And I want to attack bilinears. Right? To attack the bilinears, I also need the transformation for psi bar. Let me just copy this. 
down here. And highlight it. Because now we want the other one, right? And, and that's easy, right? I just want to know this sidebar t minus 1, right? This is the same as t side dagger gamma 0 t minus 1, right? Gamma 0 comes over here. You have to take the complex conjugate of uh, gamma 0. But gamma 0 is real in our representation. So you just get t psi dagger t minus 1 gamma 0. Hmm? And then this guy, this guy, remember that t minus 1 is t dagger. Right? So this is t psi dagger t dagger, which I can write as, um, I can rewrite this guy as, T psi T dagger dagger and then use this uh, relation because this dagger is minus one again right? I can use this in here and then take the dagger and that will mean that this becomes um, psi dagger minus T X gamma 3 dagger, gamma 1 dagger, gamma 0. Hmm. I can just insert a bunch of gamma zeros here. So gamma 0 square here, gamma 1 be dagger becomes gamma 1, gamma 3 dagger becomes gamma 3. And the effect that is that I, I'm left over with a gamma 0 here. Right? So the result is psi bar minus t x gamma 3 gamma 1 again be careful with pesking and signs here that's some strange stuff in old printings of pesking on this plot but now that i know these two relations this one and the one down here that together with this right these two streams there i can do any bilinear and, and it's easy right i just have to to take uh, uh, i don't know the the scalar one right psi dagger psi bar psi t minus one if i want to know how this transforms i just insert a t minus one t in the middle here right and that allows me to use those two relations so so for the bar I'll get psi bar minus t x gamma 3 gamma 1. For the one on the right, I'll get gamma 1 gamma 3 psi minus t x. Right? And these guys uh, square, I know they are minus 1, but I have both two of them. And so I get psi bar psi acting on minus t x which means uh, the scalar uh, bilinear is uh, even under time reversal right it goes into uh, of course not itself but it goes into the same object calculated in the new coordinates uh, with the same sign hmm? the same is true for the pseudo scalar because now, uh, what really matters, right? I'll have a gamma 5 in the middle here. Psi t minus 1, right? Now what matters, let me copy this. Uh, no, before that, right? I'll have to insert t, t minus 1 somewhere. Let's say I insert it here. t minus 1, t, gamma 5, psi t minus 1, right? Once I get this t here, it's the same story as up here with a gamma 5 in the middle. Of course, I have to be careful with the signs and all, right? But what really matters is when t goes over gamma 5, I could get a sign. Hmm? 
I could get a sign. But I don't because, again, in my representation, gamma 5 is real. Right? So that depends a lot on the representation. Right? And so this is psi bar gamma 5 psi. Just to qualify what I just said, it depends on, on the representation in the sense that uh, uh, that also changes. If I would change comma five, it would also change the definition of uh, of psi bar, and the properties for transformation of psi bar would be different too. So the way to show these properties for the bilinears is different in every in every convention. But the properties of the bilinears themselves are not depending. The, the, the properties of the bilinears do not depend on your choice of the representation for the gamma matrices, right? This is a physical uh, thing, right? Now let's look at the um, at the. Um, remember, this is not Hermitian. The Hermitian combination is really this one, right? Gamma five psi, which makes a lot of difference now, right? Because now this i that is here is a complex number. That means when it goes out, it gets a sign, right? And goes into minus i psi bar gamma five psi of minus t x. So the, really, the the pseudo scalar. If written in a Hermitian way, which which is should to go into the Lagrangian, then it is odd under time reversal, and that's an important thing we'll see later. Finally, let me see if I want to do any other bilinear. One more, the vector, just to illustrate what happens when I have a, a Lorentz index in the middle here. Let's take a look at this one: psi bar, gamma mu psi. T minus one. Again, I have to insert T minus one T somewhere. I'll do it uh, right here. Right? T minus one T. That means I get um, T minus one goes over here, and I get psi bar. Let indicate like that of minus T. That means it's calculated in this point, right? Um, gamma 3, gamma 1, but to get there, it went over this gamma mu. So this becomes gamma mu star. And here I have gamma 1, gamma 3, psi minus t. Again, this means the same thing in here. Right? And now I have to, to be careful with this guy, right? So gamma star, gamma mu star, is, um, is, I mean, the only, the, the, the gamma, the Dirac matrices in my representation, they are all real, with one exception, which is gamma 2. So, gamma 2 star, which is pure imaginary, so it's minus gamma, gamma 2, and all the other ones are equal, to, it's, it's, they are just real, right? But then I have also this gamma 1, gamma 2, 3 here, gamma 1 and gamma 3 here, which I have to put together. So I have really four different cases. Let's do them one by one. So in the case of gamma 0, take mu equals 0. This will be gamma 3, gamma 1, gamma 0, because gamma 0 is real, gamma 1, Gamma three, right? This has to go over, which gives me a sign, but square absorbs a sign, goes over, it's a sign, take to the square, absorbs a sign, this is just gamma zero. No? Mu equal one uh, or three. I can take one and three as the same thing, right? Gamma three, gamma one, gamma one or three. Both are real, so we have no sign for the complex conjugate. Gamma 1, gamma 3. Now, uh, uh, either 1 or 3 
do not have to go over because I'll have, I'll have them again here. So I have one less uh, minus sign. So this becomes minus gamma 1 or minus gamma 3, whatever the case here. Right? I have one less sign than up here. Right? And finally, for mu equal 2, I'll have all of these again. But I have a 2 here. But this guy was complex. So when I took the star, there was a minus here. Other than that, it's the same story as here. Right? So no signs. But I already have that sign. So that's minus gamma 2. Huh? And in the end, I got again. Remember this minus 1 to the mu here. Right? It's not exponential. It's not a, a power. It's just like a vector. right? Which is... Uh, positive, negative, 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 right? And now, uh, what I'm getting is this. So in the end, this is minus one mu psi bar gamma mu psi minus t x. Again, this notation is very odd also because I'm not summing over. Right? So be careful with that notation. Right? Uh, so this is it. Uh, following this logic, you can get all bilinear. So go try the pseudo vector, try the tensors. And we move on to the next discrete symmetry. So now we come to charge conjugation. Right? As I said at the start, the idea of charge conjugation is to exchange particles for antiparticles and vice versa, right? This name charge conjugation is because we know, right, if there are conserved charges like electric charge, the particle and antiparticle will have opposite values of those charges. That's also true for color in QCD, baryonic number, leptonic number, and many of these other charges that arise from global symmetries, right? Global internal symmetries of your of your uh, Lagrangian. And so uh, that's why it's called charge conjugation. Right? But thinking in terms of creation and annihilation operators, right? we know that the one particle state, uh, aside, from, um, aside from normalizations and things like that, is given by the creation, some creation operator acting on the vacuum. Right? And I want to connect that to the antiparticle, which by charge conjugation, uh, needs to be connected to this, right? And the antiparticle is created by this other operator, B dagger, acting on the vacuum. Same for the uh, future states, right? For the, the other side of uh, any matrix element you are calculating, right? So now I want an operator that transforms A into B and vice versa, right? Again, I would like this operator to be unitary and linear because that makes life very easy right and, and in this case again that's that's doable right the only exception is really time reversal right both charge conjugation and parity uh, can be written as linear unitary operator right so then all i have to do is define these operator c that acts on a P spin, right? Minus one, and turns it into B P S. Right? And same for the opposite case. C minus one A P S. Again, as I said at the start. I'm ignoring phases. I could put a phase here, right? And reabsorb by field definitions, but I'm not doing that. And again, the best, in this case, in this particular case, the best discussion is on chapter 3.3 .3 of, of Weingold, right? He really do, does this in full generality. And I'm assuming this operator satisfies this, right? Which is the simplest case, and it works. If it works, I don't have reason to go for more complicated operators. 
So I already know how this guy acts on A and B. I need to find out how, and again, it's, uh, since C minus one is C, I'll just clean up the notation. I want to know how this goes on, right? And for that, I, I need to rewrite, again, I do this game to rewrite U and V in a new form. In this case, I need to know how to write U in terms of V and V in terms of U because after I make, right, I have A, U. I'll apply the operator. This will become B. I have to rewrite this U as something proportional to V to be able to resum the field, right? So let's try to do that. It's not that, and it's not as hard as it sounds, right? I can, let's start from V, right? If I take V S of P, right? We know this is uh, square root of P sigma theta S minus P sigma bar theta S. And mind you, charge conjugation has nothing to do with space-time. Right? So uh, life gets simpler. I don't have to be changing momenta, time, and all of that. It's just really uh, um, the spinner representation here that I have to figure out. Remember, from the discussion on, on the time reversal, we know that eta s is equal to psi of minus s, right? So let's use that here, right? Let me copy this guy over. Let me copy this one over here. And let's write psi of minus s in the way we learn when doing uh, the time reversal. Right? This is minus i sigma 2 psi of s star and the same here. Now, I can take uh, the star of everything. Let me do this. I'll take this expression and calculate Vp star, right? And that will be this thing, complex conjugate, right? which is, I'll write it here. Remember, I can bring minus i sigma 2 over here. Let me do that first. Minus i sigma 2 here makes this guy a p sigma bar star. Right? And the bar is appearing because I'm commuting sigma 2. Right? Same thing here, but there's a minus here, so it's plus i sigma 2. And this, I remove the bar and make the complex conjugate. So it's p sigma star. Right? Let me just copy those guys. Up to now, I just rewrote this, right? So there's still this complex conjugation here, which I'll put out here. And now I'll use everything. So the complex conjugation on these guys just remove all stars from here. On these guys, I have to change those signs. And that means I can rewrite this expression conveniently as minus i sigma 2, i sigma 2. Remember, i sigma 2 star. Actually, I said this star will change the sign, but it doesn't because i sigma 2 star is real. This is just i sigma 2. So there's no, no change here. Right? So this is just easily rewritten. I want to invert to see I, I need uh, uh, the this this sigma bar down there. So I can write this as p sigma bar p sigma psi s psi s. Right? I put this into this diagonal to flip the order. Right? I want this uh, sigma bar down here because, of course, this 
is u s p right so i found a way to write u in terms of v v star but fine right? that's what you get and this guy i can write in terms of dirac matrices as this right gamma 2 is really sigma 2 in this diagonal right? so what i have shown here is that v s p star is equal to minus i gamma 2 u and then i can just play with it uh, as any way i want right i think i can take the complex conjugate in both sides i can multiply by the appropriate gamma matrices to to invert relations but the two i really want are these right i have u s p equal to minus i gamma 2 v s p star it's easy just invert that one and take the complex conjugate and write v s p is minus i gamma 2 u s p star all right let me put a box around this one and using this i can go into the field and rewrite u in terms of v v s in terms of u and then together with the change in the operators i can rewrite i can write the transformation for the field pretty easily let's do that right let's uh, write c psi x c s right the integral in the 3p 2 pi cube 1 over square root of 2 ep right? sum over s and now i already came with the c's they go through all the numbers and act straight into the creation and annihilation operator so the a that was here becomes a b s p times u s p exponential of minus i p x uh, the b that was here became becomes a a s dagger p right v s p uh, exponential of i p x right there's the wrong pairing between b and u a and v so I use that, I'll use those uh, expressions to fix it. Let me just rewrite uh, this guy as minus i gamma 2 v star. And this guy as minus i gamma 2 u star, right? The minus i gamma 2 comes outside the integral. This just repeats as in all cases so far. Let me get this a little bit further down. Right? Sum over s. Now I have b p s v s p star exponential minus ipx plus a p s dagger u s p star exponential of ipx and this is not psi but it is psi dagger the only difference it's it's uh it's not transposed right these guys are not a uh, line they are columns right so uh the way i'm writing this is just i gamma 2 psi dagger x transposed where right? transposed means in the spin or index right because it's still 
just the complex conjugates, not the, the, the dagger, right? And that's, that's what you get, right? So now you have the, the, transform, uh, the transformation properties for the field, right? Again, uh, as in the other cases, let me just highlight this because that's what we were looking for all along. This transformation, right? And now I need the same for psi bar, and then I can go apply these to all the the bilinears, right? So uh, another way of writing these, sometimes useful too, not only to to get the psi bar transformation is like that, right? And um, just let's insert two gamma zeros here. Right? This is Psi dagger, gamma zero, gamma zero. Just inserted the, a unity here, transposed. This is Psi bar. Right? And then using that um, um, the transpose, uh, gamma two is symmetric, right? So the, the transpose of gamma two is just gamma two. So I can bring gamma two in here and write this as minus i psi bar gamma zero gamma two transpose, which is another way of writing this transformation property, right? Psi goes into psi bar times all of that other stuff. Right? So now, if I want the expression for c psi bar c, Right. Now I'm not repeating x anymore because it, I'm doing nothing with the space time. Right? This is c psi dagger c gamma zero because gamma, gamma zero goes through the charge conjugation. This I can write as, let me bring it down a bit to put this in the form we, we want. I Remember that C is equal to C minus one, which is equal to C dagger. So I can do this, right? And use any of those uh, versions. I think I went with this one, which means I can put minus I gamma two psi dagger transposed. And I'm taking the dagger of all of this. I know I, I just have to simplify the dagger of the transpose of the dagger. Let me be careful with making a proper dagger here because there's also transpositions. This is just I psi transposed because the daggers here go away. Gamma two dagger, which is minus gamma two. So this is minus I psi transposed gamma two. Hmm? And this, I plug, I plug down here, right? So minus i psi transposed uh, gamma two, which is this part, and then gamma zero that comes from here, which again, if I want to write an expression similar to this one, right? I can just Remember that gamma zero is also symmetric, like gamma two, and write this as minus i gamma zero gamma two psi transpose. So you see the charge conjugation connects psi with psi bar, but still keeping it up. That's what the transpose does, right? It's still a column uh, uh, vector, and, and psi bar, which is a line spinner, right? Uh, goes into psi but transposed, right? So it, it keeps the orientation, right? It's not changing how the spinner indexes are summed over. Right? But that's what I wanted, and that that allows me to to go over the calculation of the bilinears, right? Let's do the scalar one first, just because it's the simplest one, and I like to leave the complicated ones for you, right? So C psi bar psi 
C. Again, I can put the identity here. I can insert a, a C square in the middle right? and use those two relations. So for the sidebar part, that will give me minus I, gamma zero, gamma two, psi transposed. And for the psi part, I'll get minus I, just take a look up here, right? Here, minus I, psi bar, gamma zero, gamma two, transposed. Right? I can combine those two and take the transpose of the whole thing, right? Uh, I have to be careful with that because if I, if I write this in terms of indexes, right? I'll have to go with this sidebar to the left of that guy, right? And I get an extra sign for that, right? Remember that you have to be careful when transposing uh, uh, fermions, right? Uh, Grasma numbers, and, and you have to be careful with that. So uh, I'll get a minus that comes from these two i's, but that's counteracted by this uh, commutation I just said, right? So this becomes a psi bar, gamma zero, gamma two, which is the transpose of this one, uh, gamma zero, gamma two, psi, uh, all of that transpose, right? And now, I have to go over gamma zero, goes over here. That's a minus sign when it goes through the gamma two. Gamma zero square is one, but then gamma two square is minus one. Right? These two guys here will give gamma two square, which is minus one. Again, the two signs compensate each other and you get psi bar psi transpose, but this guy is a number now, right? There's no spin or index is left, right? Psi bar, psi. If you want to do that with this, you don't like the transpositions, just do with explicit spin or index. But don't forget that if it is, these guys change order, you need to be careful uh, because they anti-commute with each other. Hmm? And, and that's it. So, uh, Psi bar psi is even under charge conjugation, which in this case actually means it's invariant, right? Because I got the same thing. There's not even a change in the coordinates. And I could do the same for uh, the pseudo scalar, for the vector, and for the pseudo vector. Right? I won't do it in detail. I'll put it all in a table. Now let's take a look at this table. Right? So in here I indicate if the, the, each of these bilinears and even the derivative, I put the derivative here, if they are uh, even or odd under uh, parity and uh, time reversal and, uh, and, and also charge conjugation. For uh, parity and time reversal, keep in mind, right? Remember what I'm saying here is that uh, for parity, for instance, the operator that is written there, right? Calculated x t goes into uh, another operator. I mean, the same operator, but calculated at minus x and t, right? With some sign in front, right? Some some uh, coefficient, and this is the coefficient that is shown on this on this table, right? Same for time reversal. Time reversal, I'm saying the operator goes into some coefficient times the operator calculated at minus t. In the case of the charge conjugation, the operator goes into itself. The bilinear goes into itself, right? And then I'm just saying what is the sign. And CPT is what happens if I do the three consecutive uh, 
transformation, which is actually just the product of the coefficients in this table. And again, remember my odd notation, right? Minus zoom one to mu is just this, right? Minus one, minus one, minus one, right? And it's not contracted with whatever uh, Lorentz indexes that are in here, right? So these are the properties of the, the um, bilinears. And I want you to notice something because I said at the start that the CPT theorem tells me that if I try to build a unitary uh, theory that is Lorentz invariant, and, and that means I'm putting Hermitian operators in my Lagrangian and, and building them to be Lorentz invariant, then I'll respect CPT. And you can kind of see that in this table, right? That's already true, true for these guys. Let's forget this one. This guy is not Hermitian, right? So let's forget him, right? And, and some of these guys, see, this guy seems to use respect CPT because they are odd under CPT, but they are not Lorentz invariant. So if I build a Lorentz invariant, suppose I contract two of these guys, it will be even under CPT. Same if I take this guy, right, and contract with this one, it, be, it will become Lorentz invariant, right? That's the kinetic term for fermions. Is the combination of this with this, right? Which again respects CPT. So you see that uh, all, and you can try, you can play a little bit here, and you see that all the Lorentz invariant uh, uh, combinations, which are also Hermitian, but that's easy because everyone, with the exception of the guy already eliminated, uh, is Hermitian. You'll see that every Lorentz invariant combination that you can build out of these bilinears will respect CPT. And again, remember, these bilinears cover that whole basis for all bilinears, right? So that's a very strong statement saying uh, that these uh, all respect CPT. It's not a proof of the CPT theorem. We need to be more general than that, but it's a, it's a very good indication. Right. So this is what I wanted to talk about today, right? uh, and we're done with fermions from that, and so next video we'll finally get to spin one particles and we'll take a look at the quantization of gauge theories. Yeah. See you then.